have your Bibles, I'll invite you to turn to the book of Philippians. Go to the book of Philippians. If you uh, want to grab a Bible in front of you on the Pew Bibles, you can follow along in the ESV, the translation I am reading from. But this morning is week 12 of our study, and if you look at the text, the end of the book is in sight. We are closing in. We have this message today and one more next week, and we will wrap up this wonderful letter to the Philippian church. If you recall from the very beginning of our series and our discussions throughout this series, we've been talking a lot about the relationship between Paul and the church, the individual there at Philippi. What comes next in this letter is, for us, a really beautiful picture of what the very first uh, beginning of the series, I started talking about this idea of gospel-shaped love that impacted Paul and the Philippians. This here is a beautiful picture for us of what gospel-shaped love looks like in an ongoing relationship. So remember, Paul plants the church in Philippi, and it's about 10 years before he writes this letter from a prison in Rome. In those 10 years, Paul has lived a lot of life. He's done a lot of ministry work. He's traveled to a lot of different places and preached the gospel to a vast number of people. And we're going to get to see a little bit of that in these next few verses. But it's important for us to remember here that this relationship between Paul and the church in Philippi, one of many churches that Paul planted, is an ongoing relationship. The moment Paul left the city of Philippi, the Philippian believers didn't say, well, there was that one guy one time, and they forgot all about him. There's an ongoing love and relationship that has, that has continued on through many, many years that we see played out here at the end of chapter 4. So this morning, we're going to start in verse 10, if you're looking at the text. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now, one of the hallmarks of God's people, and that you and I should understand, hopefully we've seen demonstrated around us, but certainly would gain if we are reading the scriptures, one of the hallmarks of God's people has always been generosity. In the Old Testament, as God's people are being formed into a cohesive community, a group of people, the law that God gives them actually prescribes that they must be generous people. There are rules and there's regulations that are given about how they're to harvest food from the fields, how they are to care for the poor and the destitute, how families have responsibilities to take care of one another, what to do in the case of a widowed individual or the loss of a provider in a family. The law actually gives a lot of instruction if you read through these passages in the Old Testament about how God desires his people to be generous with their time, with their resources, with the material possessions that they have. In the New Testament, this idea of generosity continues on. There's the same expectation and desire present in God's people as the church is formed from the very beginning. If you read the book of Acts and you start to see how after Jesus' death and resurrection and the gospel starts to be proclaimed, the church starts to grow, generosity marked these individuals immediately. The church gathered together and they gave of their resources generously to meet the needs of fellow believers who were gathering together with them. They were selling property. They were caring for the widows and the poor. They were being generous as God intended his people to be. And then as the church expands and grows, it moves out into new locations and places as men like Paul and the other apostles and church leaders go out and plant new churches and the church grows beyond just the initial physical location. There's a concern for people in other cities who profess the name of Christ and believers giving to meet needs in various places. Here, we find at the end of Philippians chapter 4, this generosity of the Christian people is experienced by Paul now on the receiving end of the generosity of Christians. The church in Philippi, though Paul is no longer with them, he's been gone for many, many years, we find here they have sent him a gift out of their love and their concern for their brother Paul. And Paul is grateful. He's joyful to receive this gift that has come to him from the church at Philippi. He says, I know you, friends, you've been concerned with, for me for years, and he values that type of relationship. 
I think Paul knows these are brothers and sisters who are regularly praying for him, who are thinking about him, who want him to be and be, be able to do all that God has called him to do. And that matters greatly to Paul. They are true partners in gospel ministry. As a church, we support a great number of missionaries. We send them financial gifts regularly to help support the work they're doing. But every missionary that I talk to, and I've been establishing communication with every one of the missionaries we support as a church, the thing that they repeatedly tell me is that it means the world to them that we would reach out, find out how they're doing, that they know that someone is here praying for them. They love the monetary gift, don't get me wrong, they need that to do the work. But what speaks the most to them is not money showing up into their account at headquarters every month. It's that you and I would be concerned and remember them and pray for them and be a part of the ministry in that way. Every single one of them wants to thank us for reaching out and communicating with them just as much as they want to thank us for the check that gets mailed to them. This really matters. This idea of people partnering together, of having concern and care for one another in an ongoing way is part of what God intends for his people. But right in the middle of Paul here in Philippians 4, writing this kind of thank you to his friends for the gift that they have sent him, look at what he says in verses 11 and 12. He's received a gift that they have sent out of their concern, and then he says this, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance I have faced, the secret, uh, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So, as we have seen in this letter, Paul is a great example for us as Christians. You and I have a great deal to learn from how Paul lives his life, how he describes how the Christian life should be lived. He's not perfect, obviously, as we saw just two weeks ago in the text. Paul repeatedly states, I am not perfect, I have not obtained this higher level of spirituality that makes me better than you. He says, but I do this one thing, pressing forward, straining ahead to the goal that is before me, and that's what he wants you and I to imitate. We can learn a lot from having the mind Paul has, a mind that is radically impacted by the gospel, by right doctrine and beliefs about who God is and how he works in this world. Paul here in these verses is describing serious struggles of life. He's showing us that how a mature Christian responds to serious struggles in life. He's pretty clear, I think, that he's abandoned any idea in his own life of being owed or deserving some type of comfortable, easy life because he follows Christ. Paul doesn't ever put himself forward as some man of God who deserves a mansion and a private jet and all the luxuries this life can afford like some false teachers we find today putting forward that idea. Paul says that's not what it means to be a Christian. It's not about material blessings and wealth and accumulating things. To be a Christian is to be an individual on mission who trusts God is working in and through him in all things. Paul's idea of Christianity is very different from our idea of Christianity oftentimes in the American context today. Paul speaks about contentment not about gain. He speaks about being satisfied, being okay with whatever situation he is in. In this verse, he explicitly talks about not having enough food to eat. He knows how to be content when he is hungry, to go to bed at night without enough food, to wake up and have no idea where the meal is coming from that day. Paul knows, he says, how to be content in that type of situation. Paul, like Jesus, is fine with having no place to lay his head at night. No house to call his own. No garage to fill up with all the toys and gadgets and fun things this world can provide. Paul says, I am perfectly content having none of the luxuries of this life. Even in poverty, Paul says, I've learned the secret of how to be content. But Paul also knows, he says, how to be content with having plenty. Paul is not just one who's experienced this hardship and tragedy of having nothing in his life. He's at times experienced the opposite. He's experienced great blessing, great wealth and abundance of things. He says, I know also how to be content with good things, with having money, with having good food, with having an abundance of things in my life. I can be content in that circumstance too. 
See, I think this may be the real challenge for many of us in this room, maybe even more so than being content in poverty, is you and I being content with having much. I've talked about this in a lot of different venues in the past. I've written about this as well. But I want to I reiterate this again today and help us understand how this should really sink in and challenge every one of us who sit here in America in the church today. By American standards, most of us in this room are not rich, right? Nobody had the butler prepare breakfast this morning before you hopped in uh, the Lamborghini and left your $3 million mansion to roll up to church, right? If anybody did that, I am really offended that you have not had me over for dinner yet. <laughs> but I don't think any of us in that are in that situation, right? We're not, we're not the rich like that. We, they have all that stuff. They have the big house, the nice cars, the people working for them. They have those type of things. You and I, we're, we're, not, we're not like that. We're not the rich. But globally and historically, you and I are rich, very rich. Just a few statistics from the World Bank would confirm this and hopefully drive this home maybe in a way you've not thought about before. To make it personal, if you make more than $10 a day, more than $10 a day, that puts you in the top 20% of the wealthiest people in the world. 80% of the world lives on less than $10 for the entire day. Even a minimum wage employee in America working for less than an hour and a half makes more money than individuals in 80% of the world have to live on for the entire day. But being in the top 20% is a little abstract, isn't it? So Dr. David Platt, in a teaching series he did, uh, talks about wealth distribution statistics he pulled together and puts it in categories of annual incomes, which I think all of us could think of this morning. Here's how a low income is classified globally speaking. Low income is classified as $825 or less Per year. 37% of the world lives on that. Less than $825 per year. To be lower middle income, you make between $826 and $3,255 per year. 38% of the world lives on that. Upper middle income then is $3,256 to $10,065 per year, only 9% of the world makes that much money. High income then, globally speaking, is anyone who makes more than $10,066 or more per year. Only 16% of the world makes more than that amount, $10,066. If you look at statistics in America and you pull average household incomes of those who profess to be Christians, the average Christian household income in America is $42,409. That's the average income. So some are going to be much higher than that. Some are going to be lower than that. But in America, that's the average for a Christian. And if you make that amount, the average amount in America, you are in the top 2.5% of the richest people in the world. When you and I think about being rich, we think about mansions, we think about Lamborghinis, we think about uh, fancy toys and gadgets and people working for them. We think that is what rich is. That's what wealth is. It's something somewhere else, not here, not in our house, not in our communities. Even if you're below this $42,000 mark, though, if you're above $10,000, you are richer than 84% of the world. That should impact us. It has massive implications then when you read the Bible and you read all the things the Bible has to say about the rich, that the prophets said, that Jesus said, that the apostles said, how you and I deal with our wealth, our money, matters a lot to God based on how often and how strongly he talks about money. You know, Jesus talks about managing our money more than he talks about hell in the New Testament. His teaching focused on this because it reveals a great deal of about our heart, a great deal about our religious, spiritual lives. But this sermon is not about that. So you can breathe a little bit this morning. What I want us to understand here this morning is Paul says, I know how to be content in poverty, having nothing, having no food, having nothing I can rely upon, but I also know how to be content in abundance. This morning, do you and I know how to be content in abundance? 
Because I think that's the challenge for many of us in this room today. Globally and historically speaking, we have more than most people have ever had, even if we don't have much as we look around to those around us. But are we content with that? See, that's what Paul's driving at here. Many of us, especially those of us who are younger, we, we tend to always be looking for the next new thing, right? We think the, the new phone, that's just going to make life so much better. And how many weeks or days is it until we realize this phone doesn't dramatically improve my life quality? What I probably need is the other phone, right? I need the next phone. But every year as phones roll out, we think, oh, if I just get that new phone, that'll make things so much better. Or the new computer or the new shoes or the new gadget or I need a new home. Or for some people, it's relationships. I need new friends. I need new spouses. We're always looking for something new because we think that will make us more content, us more satisfied. But even if you're not someone who's always looking for the latest and the greatest. Maybe you're of a, a, a little older generation who doesn't spend a lot of money on things, but you could still be discontent. Frugalness does not make one content. You can be a person who does not spend money, who's a cheapskate, if you will, and still not be content in your heart. I know that's true. I've seen that in a lot of people. I've worked for people who are that way. Contentment is not about how much we have or how much we spend. It's a heart posture that can be present in both circumstances. And Paul says, I've learned the secret. I know how to be content with much, how to be content with little. I mean, Paul's talking about serious things here, right? I mean, he's talking about trials and situations in life ranging from poverty to great abundance. And so what does he say then in the next verse? The most famous verse probably in the whole book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Oh man, what an encouraging verse, right? Read that verse and it gets us going. If you've been listening to my teaching or talking with me for a while though, you have to know I'm going to kind of come at this a little hard in how we typically understand the verse. Philippians 4, 13 is a massively misused verse today. We have athletes today who make this their motto, right? So famously, we have a basketball player who put this on his uh, shoes. Randy Lee, you know who I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yep, Curry, yeah. Puts it on his shoe. Either he writes, I can do all things, or he writes Philippians 4.13. It's on there. There's a big deal recently about him moving from a Nike contract to Under Armour because Nike didn't want him to put the verse on there, all this big stuff. But what does that verse have to do with basketball, really? For him, he says, it's, it's what grounds me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. As parents, we maybe have used this verse with our kids, right? To encourage them, to get them to do and try new things. I remember this was our, uh, our family motto verse growing up. We had all memorized it, and it was what we recited as we got ready to go into any competition or any type of uh, activity. Remember, hey, remember, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But here's the thing, Jesus, it's not telling us here that you can do anything you set your mind to because Jesus, he's not some fairy granting our wishes. He's not some God who says, well, if you really believe in this thing, then I'll make things go really well for you. God's not moved to make us successful if we pray really hard or really believe. I can just do it like the little engine that could. I can make it all the way. You can't just do anything because you are a Christian. That's not what this verse is talking about. I could recite this verse. I could really believe in this verse. And back when I played chess, I could walk into a tournament and I could still lose a game even if I really believed I could do all things. The other guy may just be better than me that day. Right? Context is key to understanding what Paul meant here. He didn't have basketball in mind or chess in mind or any academic test we're getting ready to take or that hard conversation we're about to have. What Paul has in mind here is not having enough food for the day. What Paul has in mind here is how can I be content experiencing poverty? How can I be content experiencing opposition to my ministry? How can I be content in the suffering that I'm going through to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? What's the secret? What's the key to that? I can do all things. I can endure all things because Christ sustains me through all of it. Not Christ gives me success. He keeps me. He sustains me. He enables me to serve him. This is much, much bigger than winning a game or being successful in our occupation. This is not Jesus giving us a magic path 
out of every hard moment. It's not Jesus going to shower us with money from heaven. It's not Jesus is going to make the other team play poorly so we can just help us get that victory today. This verse, I can do all things, is saying I can endure suffering and hardship and poverty. I can have contentment in all of that because Jesus sustains his people. He cares for us. He knows our needs. He provides for the needs of his people. Do not reduce Philippians 4.13 to some form of pagan idolatry that thinks we can be successful in whatever we want because we'll invoke Jesus' name to get it. He is not some cheap God who can be bought off with works, offerings, prayers, or incantations. So trust in this verse, believe in this verse, but read it in its context. Paul says, this is the key to contentment. I can have much or I can have little and I can endure all of that. I can be faithful to Christ in all of that because Christ strengthens me no matter what. That's what Paul's talking about here. So Paul clears that up for us, this little kind of uh, side note in the middle of his thank you here. And then he continues with his, uh, his expression of gratitude. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. You Philippians yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. But Paul, Paul's really genuinely grateful to these believers. He's not idealizing poverty in the previous verses. He's not saying, I, I wish you hadn't sent me a gift because it speaks a lot to my holiness that I don't have a place to lay my head and I'm going to bed hungry. Christians have gotten off track many times throughout history thinking, well, Christianity to be more holy is about depriving ourselves. It's about not getting a lot. It's about, it's about beating the body. It's about going to bed hungry. It's about starving ourselves and doing all of these hard things because that proves we're really religious. And Paul says, no, it doesn't. Poverty doesn't make us inherently more spiritual any more than having wealth makes us inherently more spiritual. What's really the indicator of where you are with the Lord is your level of contentment, no matter which circumstance you find yourself in. Paul's not idealizing poverty, and he isn't seeking wealth here from the Philippians either. He's content with whatever God has for him because he has an important mission at hand. This language, I, I know as you're reading it there in the Bible in English, it can seem sort of formal. It, it seems like um, maybe not as expressive as you would imagine someone who's deeply grateful to be. But in the original Greek language, this is almost an emotional phrase that Paul uses here. He's really sincerely very moved and grateful for the gift that these brothers and sisters in Philippi have sent him, not just this one time, but as they've continued to support him in his ministry over the years. As he left Philippi to minister in Macedonia and then went to Thessalonica, from the very beginning of Paul leaving Philippi, they were there. They were supporting him as they could. They were generously giving to Paul to enable him to go preach the gospel. Paul knows he's not entitled to any of this. And Paul most certainly did not preach the gospel to Lydia that day outside of the city of Philippi, banking on the fact that 10 years later she'd be writing a check to him, right? He did not preach the gospel. He did not plant the church in Philippi so he could have a source of income. Paul is so grateful that God has saved these brothers and sisters and that through them God is meeting his needs now. Look at verse 17. Paul says, it's not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. See, this is what Paul's most excited about in receiving this gift from Philippi. It's not the money that they sent. It's the fruit that that money has produced. He says, it is to your credit that the gift you have sent me, God is, is giving you credit for the work that it has produced because I have been able now to preach the gospel. I have been able to, uh, to demonstrate with power and with conviction and people have been saved and you have a part in that. He says, that's what I'm most grateful for. You, my friends in Philippi, have a hand in all that God has done in my ministry because of your support and your generosity. And the giving of the people, he tells us, not only a blessing to him personally, but he describes it in such encouraging terms there in verse 18. He calls it, the gift you sent is a 
fragrant offering, a sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul says, not only am I encouraged, not only am I blessed by what you have given to me, but God is glorified in this. God is pleased with what you have done. Isn't that an amazing thing to think about? The Bible over and over again tells us God is not a God who can be bought off, right? He doesn't need our things. He doesn't need our money. He knows that a heart that is far from him that just gives things out of some sense of duty or obligation, the Bible tells us that's not pleasing to the Lord. He's not looking at you and I. Paul is not looking at the Philippian believers saying, what can I get out of them? That's not the kind of God we serve. There's no pleasure if we just rotely give to the Lord. The Lord actually says he despises that type of giving and that type of giver. God sees our hearts. He sees where we are in this. But to those who give with the right heart, give with joy, give with a desire to participate in the mission that God is on, that his ministers, his people are doing in this world, well, that's a whole different story, Paul says. Paul says those who follow after the Lord and choose to honor the Lord with their giving, with the things that God himself has blessed us with, as we give generously of those things, those things are seen as offerings and sacrifices that are pleasing and acceptable to God. How many of us want to please the Lord with our material possessions? Right? All of us, all, all true Christians, we want to do that. As we give, we want God to look at that gift and be pleased with that. I believe that this is the type of giving that most of us in this room are doing. We're, we're writing our checks, we're giving our tithes, we're giving our offerings out of a desire to, to sacrifice something that would be pleasing to the Lord. We're giving out of a desire to see the mission continue. We're giving with joy, we're giving with compassion in our mind, not just writing a check because, well, we should write a check, that's what we do, right? Every month, as we give as a church, we give to missionaries, we give to causes, uh, the, the generous support that we demonstrate from our church is because you, as individual Christians, live out this generosity. The money in the bank account will run out quickly if we just spend what we have now. It's because you are faithful and generous as individuals to give to the Lord that we as a body then can do all of the things that we get to do, all of the investment we get to make in the kingdom happens because your individual generosity makes that possible. And so Paul tells them, look, I am pleased, I am blessed by what you are doing, and God is pleased by what you are doing. That's what we want this morning. Now, look, I am reading what Paul says. It's positive. I'm coming at this from a positive perspective. So this morning, if you're feeling any sense of conviction that your giving isn't these things, that's coming from the Lord this morning. And that may be something between you and him. If, if he's working on your heart now, hearing this description of generosity that should mark the Christian life, and you realize that's not me, then this morning you have a chance to repent of those things and deal with the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. That's between you and God this morning. You can run to him and confess, maybe I'm not living the way you intend for me to live. And you'll find him to be good and generous and gracious to you, and he will help you give in such a way that will be pleasing and acceptable to him. But that's not this message either. I'm not trying to shame us into giving more or exposing our weaknesses in that. But if God's working on your heart in that way, then I want to encourage you to deal with him on that. God is good. He's gracious. He's loving. And he shows us that this morning. As we conclude, let's look here at Paul's final promise and the confidence that Paul has in verse 19. Verse 19. Paul says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And Paul really believes this to be true. Paul himself is trusting in God for provision of his own needs. He can make it, he says, through poverty. He can be content if he's well resourced through having enough food each day or to going to bed hungry again. Paul says, I I am trusting God's going to meet my own needs. Paul views the gifts that the Philippian church has sent him as gifts from God, that it's God providing for him through his people. But more than Paul giving us this idea that, well, Paul has some special relationship with God that makes sure his needs are met, makes sure he's content, he says, no, I'm trusting God will do this in you as well. God will meet your needs, he writes to his friends in Philippi. 
This morning, nobody in this room, if you're a Christian, should be worried about God not taking care of us. He does. He cares for us just as much as he cared for the Philippian church and just as much as he cared for Paul. He will, as Paul says with great confidence, supply every need of ours according to his riches in the glories of Jesus Christ. God is faithful and good and kind to his people. He's our father. He knows exactly what we need and he meets those needs through the church around us, through individuals around us, but ultimately all those gifts are coming from God providing for us. So like I said last week, our call as we're reading the book of Philippians, as we're talking about joy and the the experience of the Christian life that the Bible puts forth to us, our call is to trust in Jesus Christ and to find these things in him. If you're not a Christian in this room this morning, the joy and the contentment, all the things that are described in this letter, these things are available to you if you become a Christian. The reality that the Bible tells us of, that I am firmly convinced of today, is you may experience happiness in this life apart from Christ. You may feel like things are going well. You may have material success. You You may find that you enjoy your life now, but you are missing out on what God has really designed humanity to experience. The deepest joy comes from a relationship with God. It comes from trusting in God. It doesn't make everything go smoothly and perfectly in our lives, but it's something deep in our hearts that gets us through the reality of this life with a deep joy that cannot be found anywhere else. It will not be found in alcohol. It will not be found in money. It will not be found in relationships. It will not be found in possessions. It's found only in relationship with Jesus Christ. So this morning, I'm calling us, if we're Christians, to again renew our trust and put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone. If you're not a Christian, I'm inviting you today to do the same thing, to trust in him, that he will meet our needs. Most specifically, he will meet our deepest need of salvation, forgiveness of our sins. It's why Jesus came. It's why he died on the cross. Is that this morning we could find our deepest need met in him. That he provides forgiveness. That he provides a restored relationship with God through his death on behalf of his people. This morning, let's pray that God would make our faith, all of our faith, real and deep. That it would be impactful we have read this morning. That we would embrace Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning and we ask that the marks of a true Christian that we've seen in this text, the generosity that should be present in our lives, the contentment, no matter if we have much or if we have little that should be present in our lives, we pray that these things would drive us to you. That, Father, if we're a Christian this morning, we would have complete confidence, as Paul has confidence, that you are the one who will meet all of our needs through your riches in Jesus Christ. This morning I pray if there are any in this room who are not Christians, that you this morning would draw them to yourself and meet the greatest need they have, the need of a relationship with you as their Lord and Savior this morning. Help us to live a life of trust, a life of faith that impacts who we are at the deepest level, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for how that transforms our hearts and makes us into people who reflect your generosity, who reflect your perfections. Help us to be content in whatever we face. It's in your beautiful name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.